Okay. Uh, Epicurus. We're, we're making a, another transition, a kind of like a, a, a really clear transition here. Before we got into reading Platonic dialogues, we dealt with a whole cluster of philosophers that we called, what we call them? The pre-Socratics, yeah? There was kind of like everything before Socrates. And then we had Socrates and Plato, we had the early dialogues, we had middle later dialogues, and then we had Aristotle. And now we're kind of entering a phase where it's just kind of like, yeah, and everything after Aristotle. Which maybe isn't very fair. And there's certainly like a sense in which it's very, very easy. And in fact, historically it has been done this way, where these Hellenistic and Roman philosophers, come on in, these Hellenistic and Roman philosophers, these kind of these uh, thinkers of the ancient era that came after Aristotle didn't really get as much recognition as they possibly could have. And there are all kinds of reasons for like why this is. Um, one of those reasons is that if we're going to tell a linear story about the influence, like so-and-so influenced so-and-so, who influenced so-and-so, who influenced so-and-so, when we look at what happens in the medieval era and what happens in the Renaissance and then what happens in this big, huge rebellion in the modern era starting in the mid-1600s, maybe with Descartes, I guess, maybe Gal Galileo, other folks like that, or Hobbes, um, we can jump over these Hellenistic and Roman philosophers like the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the Skeptics straight into a lot of the Christian philosophers who are influenced very heavily by Plato and Aristotle, folks like St. Augustine, folks like St. Thomas of Aquinas. Um, and for that reason, maybe they've been given short shrift. There are some other reasons why maybe they've been given short shrift too. And I'm not sure if these are fair reasons. This is something that I want to talk about today. Sometimes these philosophers are kind of, uh, other philosophers look down their nose at them a little bit. They're like, yeah, it's not real philosophy. It's, it's Barnes and Noble philosophy. You ever been to a, like a big, fancy, big chain bookstore? You go to the philosophy section, Maybe half of the stuff in the philosophy section is like classics of Western philosophy. The other half, maybe like a couple of little smatterings of contemporary philosophical books. A lot of the stuff in the philosophy section in a big bookstore is like self-help stuff. <coughs> that a lot of professional philosophers will look at and kind of be like, what a bunch of trash. This ain't real philosophy. Maybe we're being snobby about this, though. This is like one of the things that I want to seriously consider today. We're going to look at Epicurus. We're going to look at how his philosophy functions as a pretty serious practical guide to life. And then maybe kind of question, like, is, it, is that good enough? Is it maybe too thin? Are contemporary snobby philosophers right to kind of be like, eh, not so much? Or should we take it a whole lot more seriously than we do? Maybe philosophy doesn't have to be as complicated as a lot of philosophers make it. That's almost certainly true. Philosophy does not need to be as complicated as many philosophers make it. Um, <clears throat> it's also probably worth noting that for all of the kind of like, eh, like ways that these Hellenistic and Roman philosophers haven't gotten as much attention as folks like Plato and Aristotle throughout history, they're making a bit of a comeback lately. Epicurean philosophy, sure. Stoic philosophy is making a big comeback these days. And when we get to the skeptics, we'll look at them and see like, what's going on there as well. That's making a little bit of a comeback, but in many ways, it never really went away. Before we get into talking about Epicurus in particular and what he's talking about, let's start here. What causes you pain? What causes you pleasure? What are the things, what, what, what things in life are best? What things in life are worst? My sense is that many of you have like plenty of things like ready to hand. Are you, are you happy right now? What's in your way? What's bringing you down? Let's start with pain. We'll, we'll do the bad news first, then we'll move on to the good news. What's causing you pain or discomfort or unhappiness these days? Or in general, I heard lack of sleep. Yeah, sleep yeah. deprivation. <laughs> what else? You don't have to get too personal. You're gonna, like, well, there's a friend of mine. They're unhappy, and it's because blah 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 blah. Bad diet. All I eat is fast food. Really... The bad diet makes you unhappy. Yes. 
Like in like in the long run, it does because I'm serious. I eat fast food every day. So I feel like garbage. And <laughs> Lack of money. Soreness. Soreness. Bodily ailment. That sort of thing. Is that from anything in particular, Giorgio? Heavy lifting. Heavy lifting, which you have to do for your job. I to, yeah, I had to do it as my job. Okay. Politics. Speaking of having to do stuff for your job, oh lord, job. politics. <laughs> Speaking of having to do things for your job, jobs are they fun? No. Sometimes. Sometimes. No. No. Work. Don't be shy. Not just like the jobs that you get paid for, but like writing exams for your philosophy class. That sucks, am I right? <laughs> what else? Let me dig a little deeper. If you're not entirely happy, maybe you're not happy at all. Why not? What's wrong? We'll get to that in just a second. I'm curious about like what are the, so what are those things that make you unhappy? Sure. Anxieties, and Anxieties about anything in particular? About work and school, about politics, about lack of money? Anything else? Relationships. Anxieties about relationships? The relationships cause you pain, or anxieties about relationships cause you pain? Relationships can cause people pain. Is that true? Relationships cause people pain? Bad relationships, Bad relationships Bad. cause people pain. Yeah. Anybody thinking to themselves, like, I don't really have any bad relationships, but um, I don't really have any good ones either, and that kind of causes me pain. <laughs> Wish I had better relationships. Have we exhausted this? Surely not. What about good relationships? Do good relationships cause you pain? At times. <laughs> yeah, you think about that other person so much that can cause you like some sort of anxiety or you worry about them or I I I'm not a parent, but I can imagine like a parent that just had anxiety even if they have a good relationship with their children. Um there's always anxiety of well they're gonna be in trouble, something's gonna happen to them when they're not there. Or even not you're not even parent, just like you don't really good friends, but you haven't seen them in a while. Like, you worry that your friends might be in their own kind of pain. Your friends aren't getting enough sleep. Your friends have a bad diet. Your friends have lack of money. Your friends have bodily ailments, all those things. Yeah, their pain becomes your pain. That's the shitty thing about friendship, I guess. You got to feel stuff when they get hurt, too. Yeah. Just watching other people experience pain. Empathy is something that makes pain contagious. What a terrible emotion. <laughs> Do we need to add anything? Let's jump over. Just because I'm starting to feel a little bit down all of a sudden. It causes you pleasure. <laughs> Including the bad diet stuff that, was talk that Rachel was talking about? Mm -hmm. Rachel said, ah, junk food makes me unhappy. Does junk food make you happy? Like one cheat meal makes you happy, but if you had like cheat meals every day of your life, oh, yeah, and you start not, to feel sick. And we got it like a short term, long term thing? Yeah. Short term, whoo. Long term, ugh. Okay. Anything else? Money. Having money? Boy, ain't, ain't that interesting. Lack of money made you unhappy. Having money made you happy. Does having money make you happy? Yes. We'll get to this in just a second. You can't, but. You can't buy happiness, but you can accumulate money. You can buy things that make you happy. You can buy things that make you happy. Yes. And not having that money means you don't get to have those things that make you happy. What are the things that you want to buy that you can't buy because you don't have enough money? Passports. <laughs> Passports? <laughs> to travel. How much money does a passport cost? It's like $60? You really, like, 
like to, oh. to go to oh, I see. places. And money and the stuff you buy with money. That's true. Yeah, sixty dollars is nothing to sneeze at. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Although, yeah, the the plane ticket generally costs way more than the passport, such that the passport is typically not the limiting factor for international travel. Yeah, Bianca. Yeah, food, clothes, yeah, shelter. Um, wait, uh, is that the stuff that makes you happy? Or is that the stuff that will make you unhappy, the lack of money and the stuff you buy with it? Okay. So having enough money, that makes you feel happy or just not anxious? Yeah. When you when you like suddenly realize like I'm financially secure. So you go, ooh, that's a good feeling. All right. Okay. We'll get to this in a little while too. We'll dig a little bit deeper, but let me just kind of drop this really quickly. How much would be enough? How much money before you'd say like, I feel fine now. I don't need any more money. Never, you never reach that point ever. Hundred million? Hundred million American dollars. Seven hundred thousand extra. There are studies that show that like at least for like the United States. After you make a certain amount of income level, it's like something between like fifteen and seventy five thousand. Yeah, it's, I've heard fifty thousand per household. Happier. Yeah. Like, there's not a big difference what? between being a, a millionaire happiness and like fifty thousand dollar happiness. Yeah. There, there's a big difference between living in poverty level happiness and then fifty thousand dollar happiness. Yeah. Like, once you get out of poverty and you're like, you know, comfortable. If you have zero dollars, you're pretty unhappy. Yeah. If you can get yourself up to like fifty K per household, even not per person, fifty K per household suddenly that curve starts to kind of level off and you just don't really get any happier when you have more money. And I know a lot of folks are like, bullshit, I'd be a lot happier if I had more money. Go ask a rich person. Are they satisfied? They want more. They want more too. How come I only have a 500 series Beamer and my neighbor's got a 700 series? Yeah. <laughs> Just go over these relationship problems too. Hey, more stuff that makes you happy. We got money, we got food. Friendship relationships. I heard achieving goals. Does it matter what the goals are? Any goal? What else gives you pleasure or satisfaction or happiness? What was that? Sex. Sex? Sure, yeah. Well, can we put that in friendships and relationships? Or is that something different? Is that more like food? Or is that more like friendship? Sex does not make you happy? The relationship makes you happy. The friendship or the relationship makes you happy, the sex not so much. <laughs> this is the point at which like somebody like, like very tempted to make an off-color remark where I'm just like, maybe you're not doing it right. But um, um, I'll go ahead and put sex with a question mark because some people seem to enjoy it. Brings them pleasure. I don't know, like happiness? We'll, we'll wonder about like, is it... So, all right, complete sex. <laughs> Fair enough. Got it. Anything else? This is it? Family. Although, family could go over there with the unpleasant things as well. Pleasure from other people that we don't like, just like, yeah. Like, yeah. 
Music, ooh, interesting. Music, TV, movies, art. Other people's unhappiness? Yeah. There is? Isn't that, that makes it plural? Or is it feminine? It's just how you spell it. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Anything else? Not, not at all? Yeah, School doesn't give you any satisfaction or, or work? What's that? School, work, if it's the right kind of school, right kind of work, let's be honest, there are some classes that are pretty much drudgery. You're just like, I don't, I don't understand why I'm here. Like, I have to be here. But like, if I didn't have to be here, I would not be here. There are other ones where if you had nothing better to do and you didn't even have to go to that class, you might show up anyway. And then there are plenty of classes where like, yeah, it's hit or miss. Some days the former, some days the latter. Or some classes where like certain elements of the class are drudgery, other elements of the class a little more fun. OK. Am I missing anything here? <laughs> what was that? I feel like it should be more, but I can't think of anything. That's kind of boring. This might be part of the message, is that, and this is going to be like part of Epicurus's message, is that happiness is not that complicated. People make it really complicated, but it's not that complicated. And in fact, People making it uncomplicated, that's maybe the biggest, sorry, people making it more complicated than it needs to be, that is perhaps the biggest barrier to happiness that there is. If you would just let it be simple, you'd find out that happiness is within your grasp. We can think about that, like, we'll certainly come back to this question, but like, if you didn't really want to be here, if you didn't really want to write that exam, what would happen if you didn't do it? Just don't do it. Just go do the stuff that you like instead. Cool. <laughs> so happiness comes at a cost. Sometimes. Maybe. Maybe it doesn't have to. Maybe it could be just as simple as, do you know anybody who's like kind of a bum? Their life is really, really simple, and you look at them and you're just kind of like, mm, what a bum. But damn it, if they don't seem happy, you don't have to do very much at all. I know some guys who are like, they just, they just surf or ski all the time. <laughs> and I totally get it. Like, you go out skiing for a day, you go out surfing for a day, and you're like, Man, if I could do this every day, that, like, that might be enough. Get some fish tacos and some beers on the beach for lunch and go home. Like, it doesn't cost any money. You got to pay the rent, I suppose. Maybe you pick up like, just, a, just like some dumpy little job, enough to pay the rent. Maybe you live with like 10 or 15 other people and split the rent. And we think to ourselves, ah, that's not enough. Really? What else do you need? We'll come back to all this stuff in just a second. Maybe more than a second. <laughs> Epicurus was born in Samos, the same place that Pythagoras was born, and eventually moved to Athens a little bit later in life. Um, when he did, he started up a, ooh, a school? Not quite. This is, we mentioned this already, that after Socrates dies, Plato goes off and stays with the Pythagoreans for about 10 years, comes back to Athens, opens up the academy, the first school, the first like serious school, like philosophical school, the first university, right? It's where like academics were born in the academy. Aristotle comes to the academy as a, as a younger man. Um, ends up not inheriting control of it, starts up, he's like, all right, I'll start up my own school. Goes off, uh, tutors Alexander. When Alexander goes off to become Alexander the Great, 
Aristotle comes back to Athens, sets up his own school, the Lyceum. If we imagine this is not exactly the shape of Athens, but let's give it a little, I'll call it a rough circle. And then here's that road down to the Piraeus, where the, where the harbor is. Um, the Acropolis with the Parthenon up here, some other temples and such. The Agora, the kind of like the common marketplace, this is where Socrates used to hang out. I'll put an S there for Socrates. The Agora was here, a big common space. And there was a gate here and a little road that went out that gate. And out here was the academy. And over here, outside of another gate, was Aristotle's Lyceum. And somewhere over here was the Stoa Politicae, where we'll see the Stoics got their start. And out here, between the academy and the walls of Athens, there was a garden. And this was Epicurus's garden, where he kind of had a, just a community of friends, just people hanging out. A group of folks who were all living together under a common creed. A um, cult? I don't know about a cult. That seems a little bit strong. The Pythagoreans could maybe have justifiably been called a cult for a variety of reasons. Uh, there was a kind of like a mysterious sort of a religious aspect to, to what they were doing, um, such that newcomers would have to be initiated and they would be like, oh, what's this all about? And they're like, you'll find out later. It's a mystery for now. Lots of cults operate this way. Scientology operates this way. One of the reasons why Scientology is a cult. Another thing that the Pythagoreans asked their, their folks, yeah, yeah, I said it. Scientology is a cult. Come after me. <laughs> um, uh, one of the other things the Pythagoreans did was they asked all of their members to give up their property in order to, and so like all the property was, was shared in common. They were kind of like radical communists. That giving up of like people's personal property is typically another sign of a cult. None of these things ended up going on with Epicurus's community. Didn't have to give up your personal property if you didn't want to. You, uh, there was no mystery to it. It was actually kind of like a stunningly simple philosophy that everybody was living by. And let's see, let's try to think of some other things that were kind of hallmarks of the Epicurean community. Women were allowed and considered equal to men. The Pythagoreans also did this. Socrates advocated for this, or Plato advocated for this in the Republic, but it just was not a truth. Like within the walls of Athens, no gender equality. Out here in the garden, totally, no problem, gender equality. Slaves. We're also considered, like, if a slave wanted to join the community, come on in, and they could be treated as equal. There were still also other slaves that were kept as slaves, because how are you going to get shit done without a slave, right? You've got a garden to tend to. It was unthinkable that they would have no slaves at all, but if a slave decided that, like, they just they wanted to not be a slave anymore and become just part of the community, then Epicurus and the rest of them were like, fine, sure, come on in. Kind of remarkably open-minded for the time. Today we might look and be like, yeah, duh. Obviously, no slavery and gender equality. But it was a big deal at the time. Lots of other folks were talking about it. Few were doing it. Epicurus was a prolific writer. And an incredibly, ooh, I don't know if I want to say charismatic figure. He engendered a lot of loyalty in his followers. Like, and his followers kind of spanned like well after he was dead as well. Epicurus is doing his work and setting up his garden in the ooh, late fourth century BCE. So kind of like, yeah, late fourth century. Like th low 300s. BCE, that's late 4th century. I know it gets kind of confusing when you're going backwards, but like early 4th century would be like 399. That's as early as, as early 4th century gets. What happened in 399 BCE? Socrates died, yeah. So this is like almost 100 years after the death of Socrates. Epicurus comes on the scene. Um, you can draw some lines about influences between Socrates and Epicurus, although Epicurus claimed that he had no formal teachers. If he was drawing on an influence from one person, it would probably be Democritus. And 
that kind of brings us to one fairly coherent aspect of the Epicurean philosophy, the natural philosophy, or the physics, right? Which is a form of atomism that roughly follows Democritus. This is something that typically gets passed over when people talk about Epicurean philosophy. Usually when people talk about Epicurean philosophy, they talk about the ethics. And we'll see that there are maybe a little kind of, a few little, I don't know, Socratic influences maybe that we could, we could tell on his ethics, but Epicurus does seem to totally be going his own way. There are notable breaks with the Platonic and Aristotelian tradition going on with his ethics. I want to spend most of our time today talking about his ethics, but before we get to that, let's just get the physics stuff out of the way. He was an atomist. What does that mean? Yeah. Everything made of... How do we finish that sentence? Everything is made of empty atoms with a uh, sort of void that allows them to move freely. Yeah, everything's made of atoms. These are uncuttable smallest things, right? There's, they, they can't be divided. We've got atoms in the void. That's what Democritus said. That was his atomism. And we see like a, a variety of other things that, that Democritus articulated. In fact, a lot of the, the other pluralist folks like Epicurus, um, sorry, Epicurus. Empedocles, thank you. Empedocles and uh, Anaxagoras were saying some similar things as well to what Democritus was. They're, they're kind of like clustered together in articulating the same sort of physical cosmology. Lots of particles, like smallest bits of things, in a void, traveling around. We can basically give a physicalist account of how the universe works. Plato said, no, 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 the really real things are abstract forms. Aristotle said, well, you need form and matter together in a hylomorphic unity. Epicurus, along with all of the other atomists and fusikoi, end up saying that, no, nah, it's, just, it's just matter, really. Everything's just matter. It's atoms in the void. Presumably, you guys read this stuff on Epicurus. Is he saying anything different than Democritus was? Yes. Um, he mentions like a swerve, but it kind of swerves down and kind of like randomly. Yeah, so here's maybe what's different is that Democritus says, yeah, all the atoms are moving. Doesn't get into a whole lot of details about what makes them move. Empedocles says that uh, it's love and strife, and Exagoras says it's noose. Epicurus says what moves all the atoms is that they're all falling. Everything in the universe is going down. Everything is falling, which is kind of an interesting idea, I suppose. Everything's falling. It's all falling at the same speed. Um, plus, there are some random swerves that happen from time to time. Just pure chance causes the atoms to like zig instead of zag. They also collide with one another in perfectly elastic collisions. Some of this might seem familiar from like your intro chemistry class or something, atoms collide with one another, they bounce off one another, sometimes they bond, there are attractions, there are repulsions, blah, 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 blah. Perfectly elastic collisions of what, like an ideal gas? Yeah, sure. They're bouncing off of one another, they're glomming together, they're getting stuck in big complexes, and occasionally they just randomly swerve. Why on earth would we add this? What's the benefit of adding this swerve to the mix? Well, if we were, yeah, like, well, why, why would we want chance? It seems like one of the benefits of this account is that, like, the world becomes completely predictable. That would be nice. That'd be a great physics. Ah, oh, but the world is not perfectly predictable. Yeah, maybe this is an, an attempt to kind of capture this idea that like, well, if Democritus is right, then the world is determined and perfectly predictable. And the basic Greek sensibility is like, no way is the world perfectly predictable. There are just like, there has got to be some element of random chance 
at work here. Another thing that might pop up, and we might remember this from talking about Democritus, Democritus also had a physics, which he was like more well known for than his ethics. He also had an ethics. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but one of the things that we talked about when we talked about Democritus was his physics seems fairly deterministic, in which case, what ethics? How could we have ethics in a deterministic world? Ethics is about how you ought to act. If determinism is true, then there is no choice, right? Nobody can make any choices. There's no such thing as better or worse. There's no such thing as what you ought to do and what you ought not to do. There's just what's inevitably going to happen. There's just no point in talking about making better and worse choices if the world is deterministic. However, if we add these random swerves, suddenly the world's not deterministic anymore. Quick question, is that enough to get choice and freedom? Stanton's shaking his head no. Why not? Well, I mean, if things are swerving randomly, you know, it's like, if it swerved, it swerved. It, I mean, there's still an element of determinism to it. It's just, it's not predetermined. It's, it's randomly determined. What does randomly determined mean? Is that, is that a thing, or is that... I, I said it just now. I yeah, can't, I can't yeah, I, like exists. round square. I said it just now. I don't know if that's a thing, though, right? But, like, I mean, if it's swerving randomly, then all the choices are random. Ah, so maybe this is it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that randomness is its own kind of determinism, but it certainly ain't choice, right? If we said, all of your actions are predetermined, can you make any choices? And we're like, no, no, you can't. I'm like, well, some of them are the product of random chance. Are you in control? Not any more than you were when the world was predetermined, right? Nothing's in control when we're talking about the random swerving. Not you, not the laws of nature, nothing. There's something remarkably prescient about this, too. Like, I don't know if like, we can respect how, Demo uh, how Epicurus got here. Or we can say, like, whoa, he was doing like, some really wild early 20th century physics here. He figured out quantum indeterminacy way, way back in late 4th century BCE. There's no way. There's no, like he's just, he's just kind of taking stabs in the dark a little bit but, about this. But it is kind of remarkable that he's got something about, I don't know about the falling part, but some kind of determinism plus a little bit of just kind of like some things that are completely random and nobody can account for whether the particle zigs or zags. That's kind of where we are right now in our atomic physics. Another thing that he talks about is multiverses. He says there's our cosmos, but who, like, who's to say it's the only one? There might be like a whole bunch of different cosmoses, cosmoi, which, are, which is also a thing that contemporary physicists are saying. Maybe spooky in how like, accurate he was. Maybe just lucky. You get enough, enough old Greek guys with beards taking guesses about what the world is like. Some of them are just accidentally going to say the same sorts of things that we're going to say today. But maybe, I don't know, maybe there's something to it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not too bad. We might still have questions about, like, well, then how are we going to get to this? How are we going to get to the ethics? Because you really haven't given us any kind of theory of free choice. Well, maybe, 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 maybe not. We'll see. Yeah, perhaps. Although, yeah, gravity certainly seems to be falling, right? Although we now know that it's like a little more complicated. Gra like, falling is a species of gravity, but not all gravity is falling. I don't know. Would you say that the Earth is falling around the sun? You might, actually. This is one way to talk about orbit. Is like something is falling around something. It just keeps falling, and the ground keeps like disappearing underneath it, right? Yeah, Justin. Mm. That's a really good question. I'm not sure how well known it was, but at least as early as Archimedes, which is before Epicurus, um, folks knew or had a good guess that the Earth was curved. And in fact, it's not really all that hard to look at, at to find like really ordinary evidence that the Earth is curved. If you live in like a seafaring place, you can watch boats just kind of like. Go, if, if you live in a place where the ocean is far enough that it goes to the horizon and you watch boats go out there and you got really, really sharp eyes, you'll notice that here's the horizon and the boat kind of like 
goes up to the horizon and then it gets closer and then it gets, whoa, it's like right there on the horizon and then the bottom of the boat disappears before the top of the boat does, which is kind of one of those things where you're like, whoa, that's just, that's not going to work unless there's some curvature to the earth, right? Archimedes figured this out. If I'm not mistaken, Archimedes figured this out by getting really, really tall things and looking at their shadows and then doing the geometry and saying, like, how long should the shadow be? How long is the shadow actually? And what's the, what's the difference between what we predict that it should be and what it actually is? And this helps you figure out that, like, ah, oh, there must be some curvature to the Earth as well. So, yeah, did they know that... Uh, did Epicurus think that the Earth was an oblate spheroid? I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Would it have mattered much? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, falling towards what, right? Just falling down. So the Earth falling down, Sun falling like everything. And imagine this. It might be the sort of thing where we like, well, what's wait? Then what? If everything is falling, then what's the difference, right? In the, yeah, in the same direction, right? Well, yeah. If you were in an elevator and suddenly somebody cut the cable and everything in the elevator was falling, what would it look like? <laughs> Have you been on rides where suddenly they like, take you up someplace tall and they just, pff, they just let everything fall? You fall, plus all the stuff around you is falling. It just looks like everything's kind of floating. You could ride an airplane and they'll do the vomit comet, right? You ride it really, really, really high and then they'll just dive. They'll just fall and everything inside the airplane becomes as if it were weightless. Although you mix in some random swerving and suddenly now everything's falling and it starts to kind of like, ooh, now this thing's zigging and zagging and now there's action. So maybe that's another reason to introduce the swerve is that without it, everything's just falling but nothing's really happening. Everything's falling plus the swerve. Now we get all kinds of like weird swirls and interactions and collisions and stuff like that. Anything else? Oh, yeah. We've got a theory of perception, too. And our theory of perception is piggybacking on this idea that everything, everything is made of atoms, including you and all of your sensory apparatus. So we get this idea that we saw with Democritus in um, Mino. Socrates attributes this to Empedocles, this idea that there's an effluvium of things, right? This is what Socrates says to Mino. Mino, would you agree that there are an effluvium of things? Like Empedocles says, and Mino's like, yeah, sure. What all this means is that like, for any particular object that's made of atoms, it's constantly emitting a stream of atoms. And if we have an eyeball that's made of atoms, can I make an eyeball made out of atoms here? Does that look a little bit like an eyeball and a nose? If we have an eyeball that's also made out of atoms, there will be some interaction between this, this effluvium of things that are coming off of the object and as it interacts with the, with the eye. The way that Epicurus talks about this is he talks about films, which is a little bit different. It's more like this idea of like it's constantly emitting, like we can think of it as like little waves that are the outlines of things. And when those interact with the eye, this is how we perceive things. Gives us a description of how it is that vision works. Gives us a description of how it is that the sense of touch and hearing work. Hearing is actually, his, his description of hearing is not all that different than the way that we think about hearing. His description of the sense of, our sense of smell is almost bang on exactly how we think smell works, which is little bits of the thing that we smell are constantly being emitted from it, and they come into our nose, and they interlock with the, at the sensory apparatus in our nose and it sets off a chain reaction where we go like, oh, that smells like poop. <laughs> Every time you smell poop, it's because little bits of poop are going through the air and getting in your nose. 
Although, you know, every time you smell pizza, little bits of pizza are flying through the air and getting in your nose. So we have a theory of perception with films. We also have a theory of the soul. And what does Epicurus say about the soul? Is there one? He's got a theory of it. Yeah, there's a soul. Plato said that the soul was an independently existing, immaterial, abstract thing, a form, a capital F form, or very much like a capital F form. Aristotle said, eh, the soul is the form of the living body, but like keeping in mind that there is no form without matter and no matter without form. What does Epicurus say? It's a material soul, right? Because everything, everything, everything's made out of atoms. If there's a soul, it's made out of atoms. But you have your entire body. This is going to take a little while. Your entire body, which is made out of atoms, and then some of those atoms are atoms of a particular type. Ah. There we go. And they're dispersed in with all the rest of the atoms. And that's your soul. When the body dies and decays, the soul also disperses. Like smoke. We've heard that before, right? That's not going to show up very well. Blue on black. Let's do red on black. There we go. There's the soul. Everybody knows that souls are red, not blue. That's Epicurus's theory of the soul. Now, I'm not sure if he can really make this bridge into ethics as artfully as he wants to, if he's kind of hemmed himself into some kind of determinism plus a little bit of indeterminism. It's not really qu clear where free will is going to enter into things. It's also not really clear like, whether or not, at the end of the day, free will is going to be a defensible idea when we really get down to it. When we start making a physical account of the world, ooh, it's not, I'm not sure where we're going to find the means to talk about free will. But he does make the transition to ethics. And this is probably what he's best known for. This is also probably the part of his philosophy that is kind of lent itself most readily to building a community around, to having this Epicurean garden, to having followers of Epicureanism like well on beyond, like outside of Athens, even beyond, beyond Greece. When Greece falls, when Greece kind of like fades out of prominence and loses power and Rome comes on the scene, you have plenty of Roman thinkers who are like big, huge fans of Epicurus. After the section on Epicurus in our book, there's a little section on Lucretius, a Roman poet, first century AD. Big, huge fan of Epicurus. Feel free to read his poems, De Rerum Natura. I uh, didn't assign it, but it's definitely, you get the idea of like what a Roman poet who was into Epicurus thought Epicureanism was all about. On to the ethics, which I think is informed a little bit, as much as like, this physics gives some problems for even the possibility of ethics. This idea that we're just stuff obeying natural laws, that we're really not all that different than animals or anything else that's alive. This is a big part of creating this groundwork for how his ethics works. We can think of Epicurean ethics as maybe being summed up by just four truths, right, or four claims that they're making. The first is this. Gods are nothing to fear. Second one is, death is nothing to fear. The third one is, What's good isn't that hard to get. And the fourth one is, what's bad 
isn't that hard to endure? Now, before we get into talking about like each of these four statements separately, first a, a brief overview of what's going on with Epicureanism. Epicurean ethics is, oh, if we had to describe it in kind of like broad abstract terms that describe like all kinds of ethical theories, Epicurean ethics is an, we might call it an enlightened, egoistic hedonism. Let's break that down just a second. What is hedonism? Sure, Omar. Um, hedonism is like unrestricted uh, desire and searching for pleasure. That's kind of how we think of it today. It's also, by the way, how we think of, like, if you talk about somebody being an Epicurean today, there's an Epicurean magazine. If you looked at Epicurean magazine, it's all about, like, fine food and drink. You might think that this is exactly, and in fact, a lot of people do think when you say hedonism, they think it's, it's unrestrained pleasure-seeking, right? Literally, that's, it's a pleasure-seeking ethic. And it's easy to, like, once we hear this about Epicureanism, especially knowing what we do, or like ha having the sense of Epicureanism that we do today, to think that this is what Epicurus was all about, all about unrestrained pleasure-seeking. Aristotle talks about the pleasure-seeking life. It's one of the three types of lives that he talks about in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. We could have the pleasure-seeking life, we could have the honor-seeking life, we could have the life of contemplation and wisdom. Guess which one Aristotle goes with and says is the best life? Contemplation and wisdom, for sure. Epicurus says, yeah, fuck that. It's this. It's the pleasure-seeking life. And as soon as we say a pleasure-seeking life is the best possible life, immediately we think to ourselves, like, so what, like, orgies and drugs? Just kind of like Bacchanalian mayhem is what we think of when we think about hedonism, or maybe even when we think about Epicureanism couldn't be further from what Epicurus is actually talking about. When we see what he's actually advocating for, it actually ends up looking like a form of asceticism. It's a very, very simple life. You would never catch Epicurus eating any of the things in Epicurean magazine. And we'll find out why in just a little while. Egoistic is another big part of this. Meaning, anybody who's taken intro ethics class, what's an egoistic ethical theory? Yeah, do it's in your own interest. So we might say something like, all right, we have an ethical theory that tells us to lead pleasure-seeking lives. Whose pleasure? Your pleasure. Should I worry about other people's pleasure? Nah, not really. Only insofar as it affects my pleasure. Which again, we might look at this with an egoistic hedonism. Jiminy crickets. How could this possibly be an ethical theory? How could this po well, well, I might, I might, I might actually see where this would be attractive, where people would come and hang out in that garden of egoistic hedonism. But how sustainable would that be? Like, how could this be the sort of the sort of ethical theory that could go on for like generations, like for centuries, in fact, on even into to to Roman civilization. Well, part of it comes from this enlightened part, where we would say, like, yes, egoistic hedonism is all you need, but, but don't be stupid about it. A drug-fueled orgy. Pleasure? Maybe. Sustainable pleasure? Is it going to create more problems than it's yeah. worth, right? Is it going to create more pain than pleasure in the long run? Well, um, yeah, it might not, right? So Epicurus would say, like, well, let's, let's think about this. Let's think about, like, is this the sort of life that you could... Let's just even talk about, like... Even simple things, I don't know how many of us have experiences with drug-fueled orgies, but uh, I'm pretty sure that most of us have experiences with overindulging in alcohol. It's fun at first. Next morning, not fun at all. 
Is it worth it in the long run? No, no says Stanton. Some people are like, mm, mm. It gives you good stories. Gives you good stories? Fighting a bear gives you good stories. I don't know if I'd say, like, everybody should do it. Fighting a bear drunk gives you a really good story. <laughs> if you live to tell the tale. <laughs> yeah. Other people will tell that story. <laughs> Just don't be stupid about it. And when we realize that, like, ah, well, you're not, you shouldn't be stupid about pursuing your own pleasure, suddenly things start to look a little more complicated. Um, just looking out for yourself and not worrying about anybody else. That seems to be a little short-sighted and, frankly, stupid. You go screwing over everybody else just for your own interests, pretty soon you're going to find nobody likes you. Nobody's willing to help you out. You'll be alone. And that's no fun. You go pleasure-seeking with no regard to what the long-term effects are going to be, with no regard to like, whether or not like, there's going to be pain mixed in with this pleasure. You're going to find that maybe you've brought more pain upon yourself than pleasure. Sure, the pleasure-seeking life is the best life. That's really all that there is to good. All that there is to good stuff is that it's pleasant. And you only need to worry about your own interests. And as long as you're not stupid about it, this will work. Do I sound like a self-help guru yet? Yeah. Do we really believe this? That's the mark of an educated mind, says Aristotle. We can entertain this without necessarily believing it, that this might be enough. We saw this a little bit in Republic too, when we were wondering like, whether or not, uh, is it possible for us to act in our own best interest and everybody else's best interest, right? Does the just person need to suffer in order to be just? Is the just person a sucker? And we'd say, like, well, in a just society where everybody got along, then everybody would benefit, not just me, but everybody else. And not just everybody else at my expense, but everybody. We'd all, we'd all get along. We'd all do well. And this seems to be the sort of thing that Epicurus is talking about, an enlightened form of egoistic hedonism. And that might be enough. What about wisdom? Poo-poo to wisdom, except maybe it's not like Epicurus never talks about wisdom, but when he does, it's clear that he's talking about, he's talking about practical prudence. Practical wisdom or prudence. What Aristotle called phronesis was one of five intellectual virtues. We didn't read book five of the ethics where he talks about those intellectual virtues, but uh, phronesis is one of five. Sophia, which is proper wisdom, is another one of the five. Folks like Plato, folks like Aristotle, keen to make this distinction between practical wisdom and like proper Sophia, capital W, wisdom. That wisdom is about understanding things as they are. This one is just about being able to navigate the world, being able to figure out what the most efficient means to an end is. And Epicurus says, that's all you need. You're not that special. You're not that much more sophisticated than a mere animal. All you need is pleasure. Just don't be stupid about it. Why aren't people happy then? Why do people get all tangled up in like something more complicated than like just seek sustainable pleasure? Well, part of it is because they're afraid of the gods. Because they think like, ah, oh, there's some god that's going to be angry with me if I don't act the right way. I've got to sacrifice properly to the gods. I've got to like pray properly to the gods. If I don't do this, the gods are like these puppet masters that are pulling the strings and making things happen. And Epicurus says, bullshit. No way. Look at this. This is, this is how the world works. No gods pulling the string. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not blaspheming here. There are totally gods. They just don't do anything. And here's the reason that we know that the gods don't do anything. Do we think that the gods are happy? Are the gods content? Or are the gods frustrated? Are the gods like, mm, I want the world to be different? 
And actually, you know, you read some of you read some of the Greek mythology, and they, they are kind of like, oh, I want the world to be different. But let me like, if you were serious about thinking about a supreme being that was infinitely powerful, created the universe to its exact specifications, do you think that they would be upset about anything at all? Then what's there to change? Why, why, why do this when you could just set things up and let them go the best possible way? Epicurus is, he kind of does a little tip of the hat to like the possibility of theology, but he does it in this deistic way, where he says, sure, the gods created everything, they created it in the best way. The gods are supreme beings. Here's like how we should think of the gods as supreme beings. The gods are happy. The gods are completely content. The gods do not worry about anything. You think that some, like a group of beings, supreme beings, that are just kind of infinitely blissful all the time, you think they care what you do? I think they're like watching you cheat on your philosophy exam and be like, oh, oh no, we have to change this, smite. <laughs> ah, they don't care. <laughs> the gods are nothing to fear because they have no involvement in the world. The gods are just, if, the gods are another thing in the world just like everything else. What makes them different from us is that they're, they're happy, not like us. We could be happy. We could be like the divine. All it would take would be letting go of all of those things that stop us from being happy. Here's probably the biggest anxiety we have. The biggest thing that like, when we say, like, oh, how are you feeling? You feeling okay? And you're like, no, why not? Because I'm afraid I'm going to die. Is that not like the best justification for being unhappy? We could think of like, uh, I, you know, they didn't have what I wanted at the cafeteria today. Like, oh yeah, that guy's going to die. Who has more justification to be unhappy? Probably the guy who's about to die, right? If there's anything to fear in this world, surely it's death. Everything else compared to death seems like small potatoes. Then again, Epicurus says death is nothing to fear. Why not? He says it quite succinctly in his letter to Menesius. We have the letter to... We kept track of this, right? His physics is laid out in... The, we only have a few surviving bits of text from, uh, from Epicurus. Most of them come from Diogenes Laertius' Lives of the Philosophers. This is on the letter to Herodotus. Not that Herodotus, not the Pe Peloponnesian War Herodotus. He was earlier. Um, a lot of this stuff comes out in the letter to Menesius and his principal doctrines. What does he say about death? Why isn't it anything to fear? Because he wants to live forever. That's an interesting point. Not what he says. <laughs> Although, yeah, he says similar thing. He says it's, it's kind of like shameful to like try to hold on to life, right? If we recognize that everybody's going to die someday, it does seem just kind of silly and shameful to like do everything in your power to keep it at bay. To say, like, not yet, I'm not dying today. He's like, look, you're going to die someday. Fighting this inevitability is one of the reasons why we make more trouble for ourselves than we actually need. But he gets a little bit deeper about why it is that death is nothing to fear. Francesca? Um, he talks about sensation. He says, basically, when you die, you don't have any consciousness of sensation. So That's right. if you're afraid that you're going to feel pain, that's not true. Yeah, there's no, there's no pain in death. What is there to fear? When you're capable of feeling things, when you're capable of having experiences, including like the experience of suffering, you're not dead yet. When you're dead, you're no longer capable of experiencing any suffering. The way he says it is like, while you're alive, death's not around. When death is around, you're not around. So what is there to fear? It's just... The end, which is also kind of like a spooky, scary thing. But if you reflect on it, like, before you were born, you didn't exist. Are you, re are you like, really put out about that? You're like, oh, I wish I was alive before I was born. I mean, I was happy until I was born. Were you happy until you were born? <laughs> According to Epicurus, you were nothing before you were born. Yeah, what if you really love, like, the pleasures of life, but that could be... 
So this would be a good reason to not throw your life away needlessly, right? Yeah. If there's any pleasure, if there's any good things to be had, they're to be had while you're alive. But death is not painful. But it also means and it's nothing to be feared. It's just losing the things that were pleasant. Which is actually interesting because that brings us to this next thing. What's good in life isn't that hard to get. What do you need in order to be happy? You probably need some food, right? Do you need delicious food? You just need a garden, right? Yeah. Cicero, who's not an Epicurean, but like fairly well influenced by the Epicureans. We'll see when we get to the Stoics that there's like, ooh, there's a lot of overlap. Cicero said all you need is a garden and a library to be happy. You need some food. Does it have to be, does it, do you have to have a lot of it? Just enough to not be hungry, really. Does it need to be delicious? Yeah, it should probably not be disgusting. Potable water, edible food, not totally disgusting. Bowl of brown rice and a little bit of seaweed. A couple of vegetables if it's a good day. But delicious food is nicer, isn't it? If we're talking about a pleasure-seeking life, don't we want a little meat, a little, little bacon on top? Mm, mm, a little bit of bacon makes everything better. Until you get used to it and you don't have any bacon anymore. Then you're like, where's my bacon? Attachment's a problem when it comes to pleasure, right? It's a weird thing about pleasure. Socrates says this at the beginning of Phaedo. When he takes the, the irons off of his legs, he says, boy, it feels nice to take those irons off. Isn't that weird? Like it was painful, and then I stopped the painful thing, and now it feels pleasant. Works the other way around, too. Have something pleasant, take it away. And now you're like, oh, oh, where'd it go? It's painful to lose things that you like, unless you're not attached, right? One of the secrets to this is, don't get yourself attached to anything that you don't need to have in order to survive or in order to be happy. Can you live without it? This is this thing that Epicurus will ask his followers like over and over and over again. People are like, hey, Epicurus, I don't know, should I do this? And he's like, can you get by without it? Maybe better than can you live. Can you, can you be happy? Can you be happy without it? Could you be happy without pizza? Some folks are like, no. no. Ah, be serious about it. If you could never have pizza again, you think you could make it work? Yeah. Yeah. It'd sting at first, but you'd get used to it. Anything that can be taken away from you that you don't need in order to survive. This is something that you should not get yourself all wrapped up in. You need food. If you don't eat that, that you're going to like you're going to have pain. There will be pain if you don't eat food. If you don't drink water, there will be pain. If you don't find yourself some sort of shelter, there will be pain. How are we doing on time? I'll go ahead and toss this in. If you don't have friends, if you don't have do you need friends? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, let's. Uh, well, well, just kind of put a pin in that for a second. Friends, of the things that we need, of the things that are good, that aren't that hard to get, it's a healthy body and a peaceful mind. That's it. We can take care of the healthy body easily enough. Just get your get yourself enough food, get yourself enough water. Every now and again, if there's a little luxury that floats your way, go ahead and partake of it, but don't get too attached. Don't become reliant on it to where, like, when it goes away, and inevitably it will, you're going to be all bummed out. Yeah, who needs that? That's unnecessary pain, right? Don't be stupid about it. Don't get yourself addicted to luxuries that you can't sustain, that you don't need. Keep it simple. Peace of mind, 
What do you need for peace of mind? If you can convince yourself that you don't need to worry about anything, you got peace of mind. What do people worry about? They worry about death? Don't worry about death. It's nothing to worry about. You worried about the gods? Don't worry about the gods. You worry that you're not going to get what you need in order to be happy? You need so little to be happy. Stop worrying about it. It's, it's way simpler than you think. All of these things that you're convinced that you need, that's advertisement. That's like people telling you that you need shit that you don't really need. There's something definitely to this, right? On the one hand, like, I, there's a part of me that wants to say, like, I don't know, Epicurus, you're, maybe you're making it a little bit too simple. There are definitely people that, like, they're not dead, but they're not happy either. And it's not like they just need to improve their, their perspective on life, right? Somebody who's chained to a conveyor belt. Somebody who's, uh, like, I don't know, picking cocoa beans as a slave in the Ivory Coast. They have enough food. If they could just manage to get peace of mind, they'd be like, this is a pretty good life. Bullshit, that is not a good life. I don't know. Maybe there's something to this. Maybe there's also something to this idea that, like, if I was to follow Epicurus's advice, I might say to myself, like, well, then why, like, why did I stay up last night reading shit about Epicurus? I could have just come in and been like, what do you guys think about pleasure? People would have stared back at me, and I would have been like, hmm, you guys want to go? Yeah, let's go. Let's all just go hang out in the garden. Yeah. I don't need to cover specific material. I don't need to try to, like, publish stuff. I don't need to try to, like, make myself any better than I am. That's other people telling me that I need to do that. Is that good enough? I'm torn on this. I'm genuinely torn. Are those pressures like good things that get me to kind of step up, be all that I can be? We got this Aristotelian picture where he's kind of like, here's where, like, this is virtue. It's up here. Nobody gets there. It's a target. Keep reaching for it. And I'm like, oh, I'm not virtuous enough. And he's like, good. You should feel a little bit ashamed so that you keep working at becoming better. And I'm like, all right, uh, I'm, I'm not generous enough. I'm not courageous enough. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm ashamed. Good, you should be ashamed. Not like so bad that you just like curl into a ball and cry, but enough that you keep trying. And Epicurus seems to be saying to me, maybe, maybe there's like a place where they meet. But Epicurus seems to be saying to me like, ah, stop worrying about all that shit, just be happy. It's incredibly simple. You don't even really need to pay rent. You don't even really need to buy food. They throw away so much food. <laughs> behind restaurants, behind grocery stores, dumpster dive behind the food lion, food's taken care of. Squat in an abandoned house, house is taken care of. <laughs> what else do you need? Get a whole bunch of other freegan friends to like come and join me. I got it all. What's the problem? And maybe part of the problem, which is like one of the problems with freeganism is that like you're living off of the waste of others. And if everybody did this, if everybody lived the same way, there would be no dumpster to dive in. Kind of reliant on the idea. And we might wonder the same thing about the Epicureans as well. Like how sustainable was this? Without like an outside group, that's kind of generating products and wealth and stuff like that. Is it enough? Maybe there's, and maybe it's just a question of like tuning it right. As soon as they found out that it was unsustainable, Epicurus would be like, okay guys, we need to do a little more work. Otherwise we won't be happy. What's good is not that hard to get. And really at the end of the day, it's just freedom from pain. If you can just make sure that you are free from pain, here's this kind of weird inversion in Epicurus's hedonism. We portray it as a pleasure-seeking ethic. At the end of the day, it ends up being really just freedom from pain. Epicurus says, this is the limit of happiness. This is as happy as you could possibly get to just not have any anxiety or pain at all. To be unperturbed. To be tranquil. The Greek word is ataraxia. 
another one of those alpha privative words. You got an a ah to mean no, and then taraxia, which is getting it. It's, it's uh, to be bothered or upset or perturbed, right? To be unperturbed, to be calm, to be tranquil, to be serene. This is, at the end of the day, this is Epicurus's enlightened egoistic hedonism. Just try to be calm. Avoid anything that's painful to the extent that you can. And when the painful things come your way and there's nothing that you can do about it, just endure them. And that's one of those things where you can say, like, easier said than done, Epicurus. Did you guys read how he died? Kidney failure after suffering, like, trying to pass huge kidney stones for two weeks before he died. And apparently, he was cheerful the whole time. I hear kidney stones are, like, there's very difficult to compare these sorts of things. Pain in general is one of those things that like, it's, it's tough to quantify. Different people experience it in different ways. I've heard kidney stones described as worse than childbirth. Imagine being in labor for two weeks and having a good attitude about it. Epicurus said, I just, I just reflected on all the good times with my friends. It's asking a lot, maybe. Harder than it looks all of a sudden. But maybe, there's a, maybe that's all that there is to it. Now it's totally self-helpy, right? Now it's like the secret. <laughs> is it thin? Is it shallow? Is it philosophy? I think it's philosophy. Is it good philosophy? Pretty radical at the time. Folks are still talking like this. Yeah, but they haven't added. Yeah. We can say, like, in fact, I would, I would venture to say most self-help gurus that you find are peddling some version of Epicureanism. This idea of, like, don't be attached to the things that you can't control. Don't be anxious about things that aren't really that important. When bad things come your way, just grit and get through them. They're not that hard. Epicurus says, there are pains that are intense and there are pains that are chronic. Very few pains that are intense and chronic. Very few things that are kind of like, they, they're constant. I'm constantly experiencing this pain and it's intense pain. I happen to know some folks who are enduring like very intense chronic pain. And I'm curious if Epicureanism would help them or if they would be like, ah, shut up. Just try to be happy. It's not that complicated if you don't let it be complicated, says Epicurus. We're going to get a very similar kind of take on this, uh, slightly different. We'll, our task is going to be to sort out the differences between Epicureanism and this. We'll be looking at Stoicism next. We're going to take two days on it. First round of Stoicism will be Epictetus. Epictetus was a slave. And we'll find, yeah, Stoicism, that seems like a really, actually, a really kind of unsurprising philosophy for a slave to have. And then we're going to read Marcus Aurelius, an emperor of Rome, who was also a Stoic. That's an interesting kind of pair of figures to talk about a philosophy. One who's a slave, one's an emperor, both representing the same philosophical outlook. That's all. I'll see you guys on Thursday.